Hi, I'm Robot Bobby, and I'm picking off where we left off last time in the last video called Swirling Rainbows and describing the shader that's on each of these spheres. So let's jump right in. The code is available on GitHub, and we're going to walk through building that shader now. Let me just get on over here. So writing shaders is going to be a little bit different than just writing JavaScript code using 3JS to create artwork. Um, because we're writing these, uh, uh, let's talk about shaders. Shaders are little programs that run on your GPU. Uh, and they run for each pixel. Um, in this case, the fragment shader runs for each pixel in this in this browser window. Um, there's also a vertex shader, and that will run for each uh, vertex in your scene. Um, we're not going to talk about vert vertex shaders in this video. We're going to focus on the fragment shader. I've got a very simple 3JS scene here where I'm creating all the scene boilerplate, and then a simple po a plane geometry. I was going to say a polygon. Just uh, two triangles, and I am applying a shader material to that plane geometry. Okay. Um, previously, I had created a bunch of spheres and then applied this shader to those spheres, but in order to build out the shader itself, we want to just keep it simple with a plane. All right, so that's what this scene does. Um, then with that set up, I can come over to my fragment shader and we can talk about that. First, I'll, I'll just show you that the, the shader is being rendered. I uh, just changed the, the G and the R values of the color to uh, one and zero, but not respectively. <laughs> so um, the, Things, the very simple shader you have here, let's just ignore this bit for now. Um, we'll explain that later. Your shader must have this function called main, which has a, a void keyword in front of it, which just means it returns nothing. And it must have this global variable, gl underscore frag color. Okay, that's gonna tell each pixel what color it needs to be. If I change this to a zero, the red, green, blue values are all set to zero and the alpha set to one. Okay, uh, I like to pull out these values, color, and place them in its own vector3 type variable. Thank you, GitHub Copilot, for the autocomplete. And just to show you that that's, that's compiling. Um, by the way, I'm using a couple of handy plugins here that, uh, for VS Code that I think might be helpful to all of you as well. Let's just get rid of this recommended. And that is this shader languages support. And that allows for syntax highlighting of the GLSL as, all, as well as live server. And I've got that running down here. Okay. So those are recommended if you're using Visual Studio Code. So back to the shader. Uh, I've got my GLSL, which stands uh, for OpenGL shading language, um, and it's in this file, .glsl. Okay, so I've pulled the color out, so you can see how that works. Why don't we create a shape that we can look at on the screen now? It's kind of boring to just look at a giant field of color. Um, I'm gonna create a circle, and it's gonna look like this. Um, float circle is equal to um, distance st, comma vec to 0 0.5 so what the heck comma 0 0.5 thank you github copilot so what the heck is is this um distance is a built-in function to the open gl shading language and i think you'll see that i've got an error here um, because i haven't defined st um, what, is, what is ST? ST is the coordinates. Um, so in order to kind of get access to each individual pixel, I'm, I need those coordinates. Thank you, GitHub Copilot. Another global variable, GL frag chord. Easy to identify because of this GL underscore. And uh, um, 
resolution. I haven't defined resolution yet. Let's do that. That's going to be a uniform resolution, uh, which is effect two. I forgot to indicate that. Okay. I think I've gotten rid of those errors now, but uh, my, my circle is not going to work yet. If I, if I try to view it, circle, it's just white. No errors though. Great. That's because I'm not passing this uniform vec2 into my shader. My JavaScript program over here uh, is, is feeding some data down to the shader. That da the data that it's feeding are these uniforms. Okay, and those are passed into the shader material when it's set up, along with the vertex shader and the fragment shader. So let's give um, this uniform resolution. Uh, it's a value, new vector three. Thank you. Vector two, rather. So what's this? And there's our, uh, this dark circle in the middle of our screen. I pass down to the shader the resolution of the viewport, in this case, the browser window. All right. And um, now that that's set, this fragment shader has access to that value. Isn't that wonderful? And I can access each individual pixel coordinate now. Um, if you want to see this more clearly, I could apply a step and define a radius like 0.1. And that's a, a ratio of the screen. So 1% of the, uh, sorry, 10% of the screen. And now we can see that circle in the middle. Okay. That's, um, that's great. This, this function, this distance function is saying is just measure the distance from this coordinate 0 0.5, 0 0.5, right in the middle. I'm pointing at the middle of my screen, you can't see that, and the current pixel coordinate. Keep in mind that these programs are running uh, on every pixel, these little tiny programs. So that's how that works. It's, it, it's a shift in thinking, but hopefully it'll make sense as we go along. Great. Okay, now I want to take that kind of circle, this hazy, dark circle, and create a ring instead. To do that, I'm going to write a stroke function. It's going to look like this. It returns a float, a stroke, <clears throat> and it's going to take in a float shape. It's going to take in a, a radius, also a float. Hang on a second. I do that a lot. And it also takes in um, a stroke width. Okay. And it's going to return, no, GitHub Copilot, that's not what it's going to return. It's going to, what it's going to do is, using those step functions I, uh, I, I used a moment ago, let's say uh, float outer, well, not powder, outer, equals step radius, whoops, and then the shape minus the stroke width times 0 0.5. And I meant to say plus, my bad. Look, that's the outer. The inner is just minus that. And I'm going to d calculate a circle, just like I did a moment ago, for the outer and then the inner. And then subtract the inner from the outer. Does that make sense? So I'm going to return um, outer minus inner. Okay, and that's that's going to look like this. Hang on, I'm going to do it. Uh, float ring is equal to stroke. Thank you, GitHub Copilot. Uh, the radius is not 0.5 though, it's 0.3, and this is going to be a little bit thinner as well. And then let's just render that by render it by passing it to the color. Isn't that nice? Again, what we do, we calculated the outer radius and the inner radius, and we subtracted the 
outer from the inner. Subtracted the inner from the outer. All right. All right, the next thing I want to do is to create 10 of those. I'm going to use a for loop to do that. Okay. Just indent this a little bit here. Uh, for float i to equal 0, 0. 0.0. Well, i is less than 1.0. i plus equals 0 0.1. And put the other one here. Thank you. Uh, I broke it because now uh, this this color we need to change this so that we're actually um, updating color each time through the loop. Thank you. So now we've got a ring drawn ten times, and we only see one ring because they're all stroked up on top of each other. Instead of that, I'm going to replace this radius with i and oh, i. And now we see a bunch of concentric rings, uh, starting with uh, zero, and then uh, uh, radiating out from there. I'm just curious, what if I did my one one point zero minus i? We'd start from one and go down to zero, and it's basically the same appearance. I can modify the the width of the stroke here, make it fatter. The white is the stroke, and make it even fatter still, right? Great. In fact, why don't we set it to something like one, and it turns our whole screen white. Let's change the color for each one of those. We'll say um, vec3 cur color is equal to vec3i. All right, and I'm going to say our color plus equals our cur color times that ring. Okay, what the heck just happened? Um, GLSL has this great feature of casting types, right? I can just pass in a float and say, actually, just make use that same value for all three of the um, dimensions of that vector. In this case, it has three dimensions of a, a VEC3 has three uh, X, Y, and Z. So just use that same value for all three. Isn't that, isn't that great that it'll do that for you? If I wanted to just use it for just the red portion, I could do that as well. And now this will be red. I mean, you get the idea, purple. You get the idea. Um, we're just doing grayscale for now. Great. Uh, what's next? Let's animate this so that those circles radiate out. And to do that, we need to add another uniform. It's uniform float. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Um, it's not defined yet. What that's going to do is affect the, the radius. Right now, our, our radius is set to i. Let's define that as radius. And that'll be a float radius is equal to i. But I really want that to be i plus time. OK. And that's not going to change currently because time isn't changing. We'll go back to our JavaScript program. And we'll add another uniform. Um, it's time. And its value is 0 and a comma. Um, but in, it, as we're running this animate loop, I'm going to update that each time. Time equals t. Um, when using the request animation API in JavaScript, um, the method you call it gets this timestamp automatically. Isn't that cool? So now, uh, I think I broke something. Hang on. Uh, it doesn't look like I broke something. Hang on. Oh, it just explodes out. Here's slow it way down so you can see it. So there you go. The um, circles are expanding, expanding until they just expand off the screen and you don't see them anymore. I think right about there is good. 
Oh, that's too fast. So to have them cycle and not just expand and disappear, I'm going to use another built-in method, racked. And that, what this built-in function does is to return only the fractional part of the value. So between 0 and 1, it'll, it'll have that fractional value. And then when the value goes beyond 1, as time continues to increment, I'll only get that fractional value again. And so what that effect is, it, it loops. It appears that the circles are born again each time because we're just chopping off the, the integer value. Um, and there's, there's a way to kind of fix it so there's, there you don't have a little blink in the middle. If I just add uh, 0 0.1, sorry, subtract 0, 0 0.1. Now, I don't know why this works. <laughs> if, if you know, leave a, leave a comment below. Now they just smoothly expand from the center. Isn't that nice? Okay, so color. Um, we saw before that we could just add color by, uh, you know, filling in just certain channels of the RGB value, but let's add multiple colors, the, the rainbow of colors. To do that, I'm gonna borrow a method uh, that I found on thebookofshaders.com. Amazing resource, highly recommend you check it out, and I'll, I'll include links to it uh, in the video description. Um, here, I have to go grab it from here. So I'm grabbing this method here, which is gonna, it allows me to pass in hue, saturation, and brightness values and get back an RGB value. This is really handy. Um, I'll show you what I'm talking about. Um, this is HSB2 RGB, and I'm passing in a VEC3. And I need to have other, other, well, if I just leave it like that, let's see what happens. Okay, we're getting a bunch of different hues. Isn't that cool? Um, I'm going to pass in I for the hue, 1 for the saturation, and 0 0.5 for the brightness. And now we get a nice rainbow. I'm going to boost the brightness a little bit. Okay, if I had just passed 1.0 for the uh, hue, it's pretty boring. <laughs> But uh, 0 0.5 should be like a greenish color, I think. Or oh, sorry, cyan. I think 0 0.3 is green, right? So I guess 0 0.66 is blue. Great. But uh, I was looking pretty good there, wasn't it? Um, and let's pass in I for the brightness as well. It's a little bit dark. And. I don't know, there's something weird about it. What if I said 1.0? I'm going to invert that value. That's much better. Okay, and you can play with these values. Um, you could uh, boost the minimum a little bit. For example, uh, one petal minus I, but plus 0 0.2. So it's a little bit brighter. Like the darkest color is not black now. It's this dark purple color. You know, you could really blow it out, um, and which I don't feel is good. <laughs> I kind of liked that at 0 0.2. Um, we've just finished our shader. Um, and I didn't even, oh, there's one thing we could do that we haven't done yet. If we go back to our scene, you'll see that every sphere is using the same shader. They don't, they're not individualized. And that's, we need to add a, one more um, kind of global variable not a global variable it's a bad way to put it it's called a varying and it's a vec2 and i'm calling it v u v okay this value already exists in my vertex shader and i'm i'm i call it v u v because it's a, a varying uv value i'm assigning this uv value which I'm not going to get into right now, which the 3JS just provides to the vertex shader. And I'm saying assign that to this VUV. And because it's a varying, OpenGL ES knows, hey, 
that's going to be shared with the fragment shader. So all I have to do is just define it here. And now I can use that varying in here. I hope this is not too confusing. Um, I'm going to redefine this ST as just VUV. Taking in what was passed from the vertex shader. Now each sphere has, has, uh, has mapped, it, it has the shader mapped to its UVs instead of sharing like a global value. I hope that makes sense. This is my first time discussing shaders. Uh, I, I hope this was helpful. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. Also, let me know if there's something that you'd like to see or questions you have. I really appreciate the comments and questions. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.